Hello and welcome. My name is Selena Moore and here at the School Based Health Alliance, we would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar entitled Quality Counts, Learning About Adopting the Five Standardized Performance Measures for SBHCs. Today's presentation will describe the School Health Services National Quality Initiative, NQI, an initiative that is challenging the school-based healthcare field to adopt and report the first ever set of standardized performance measures. But before we begin, we have a few housekeeping reminders. First, please help us with our attendance count. If you are viewing as a group, please go to the chat window in the question box and type in the name of the person registered and the total number of additional people in the room. For example, Tammy Jones plus three. This will help us with our final attendance count. All attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the question box located in your GoToWebinar control window. We will address questions following the presentation. At the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in three to five business days. Please also visit School Based Health Alliance for additional webinar, archived webinars for topics such as the ones you are viewing on your screen. And at this time, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Haley Love. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Selena. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining um, this afternoon for this webinar. Um, my name is Haley Love. I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation um, for the School-Based Health Alliance, and I'll be uh, presenting with my colleague, uh, who, who's on the line, will help um, with questions and the discussion later in the conversation, Samira solomon -Poor. So. I just want to start by giving a shout out to the fact um, that we have a really incredible team working alongside Samir and myself on this initiative. Um, and we want to thank everyone for the efforts that they've invested in, in these initiatives so far and will continue to invest to make it strong and to reach our goals. On the screen, um, all of these colleagues are both based here at the School Based Health Alliance and members of uh, our field who are have contributed enormous amounts. So thank you. So our objectives for today's presentation, I'm going to start with a few um, NQI basics. NQI stands for National Quality Initiative, and I want to give you a little bit of background on the initiative and our objectives. Then I'm going to talk about the five performance measures for school-based health centers with some brief background on how they were selected. And the real pre meat of this presentation is talking about promising strategies that are emerging for the adoption and reporting of these, of these five measures. Toward the end of the webinar, we'll ask us, are, are you ready to join us? Are you ready to join us in this national initiative? And at the end, we want to open it up to discussion with all of you to sh uh, be able to field questions uh, and allow participants on the call to share ideas strategies, reflections on this national initiative and getting involved. So I thought we'd start uh, the webinar with a little bit of humor. With the words of W. Edwards Deming, who's one of the fathers of quality improvement, and he likes to say, in God we trust, all others bring data. His sense of humor didn't end there. He put it as saying, it's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. So with 
these two quotes, we're going to jump in today's webinar and talk about the School-Based Health Alliance's National Quality Initiative, an initiative that will help us tell that compelling story of school-based health centers with data, data that can amplify our powerful anecdotes, data that conveys the hard work that you do every day, the comprehensive care that school-based health centers provide that help children lead better lives. I'll invite you to join us and work together to improve care for children and adolescents and strengthen the sustainability of our field. So about two years ago, the School-Based Health Alliance and the Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland were awarded a grant from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau called the School Health Services National Quality Initiative, or NQI. This initiative is challenging the school-based health care field to voluntarily adopt and report the first ever set of standardized performance measures. So what does this initiative make possible for us? We believe that if school-based health centers can align priorities and voluntarily collect data in a standardized way, we'll be able to describe the quality of care being delivered in SBHCs at the national level, which is paramount to the sustainability of the model. As the healthcare landscape becomes increasingly competitive and based on value rather than volume, we need to be able to demonstrate the care being delivered. And by reporting standardized data to the Alliance, SBHCs will be able to compare themselves at local, state, and national levels and assess their strengths and areas for improvement. And finally, by investing time in assessing our data and identifying ways to improve practices, the quality of care that children receive will improve. As the saying goes, What's get me what gets measured gets done. Together with this initiative, we can improve care for children and adolescents. The Maternal and Child Health Bureau set an ambitious target for us. They want to see 50% of school-based health centers voluntarily adopting and reporting performance measures by 2018. So how can we work together to achieve this goal? Well, we've already started. We've been working together with members of the field since day one of this initiative, knowing that its success hinges on working together at every step. We didn't hide in a dark room to pick the performance measures. We needed you, the field, to tell us what we should be measuring, the measures that convey our value add to the healthcare system, so we invited people representing diverse stakeholder groups to help us. Alliance members, board members and staff, school-based health center providers and administrators, representatives from state affiliate organizations and government offices that fund school-based health centers, and educators and payers were part of a process. Ultimately, 90 individuals representing the field participated in the process, which took about six months to complete. We asked you to examine, discuss, and score potential measures that could capture the value add of our model. And you told us what measures you think are the most sensitive, important, feasible, and usable for quality improvement and advocacy. And we listened. After three rounds of scoring, five measures were selected. This was a big feat and represents the first ever set of standardized performance measures for school-based health centers. You decided that the best way to demonstrate the value add of SBHCs to the healthcare system is to work to ensure that children and adolescents have an annual well-child visit, risk assessment, and BMI screening. You also decided that adolescents should be screened for depression and chlamydia. We're thrilled that with the measures that were selected. They align with existing national child quality measurement frameworks such as HEDIS, CHIPRA, and meaningful use, 
allowing school-based health centers to compare themselves not only with one another, but with other healthcare settings. Because right now, the way school-based health center reports data looks a little bit like this. There's commonality, but with measurement, the devil's in the detail. And there's considerable variability across states and programs in the definitions of the measures. This initiative allows us to be able to compare apples to apples and be aligned not only with one another, but also with national child measurement priorities. We're also thrilled with these measures because they're diverse and allow us to capture aspects of physical health, the nutrition and reproductive health of young people, and behavioral health through the risk assessment and depression screening. And both are child and adolescent focused. We see these five measures as our starting point, and we anticipate that the measures may expand in the future as we grow in our understanding of the interaction between health and education. For example, by next year, our goal is to introduce a measure that will allow you to document the amount of seat time saved when children can access care in a school-based health center ultimately helping reduce absenteeism and improve student achievement. These five measures are meant to be a manageable starting point and allow us to start aligning our priorities. From day one, we said we need to meet the field where it is, and we think that these five measures represent a set of measures that the school-based healthcare field is ready to adopt and report. Since last fall, a number of very brave school-based health center programs in eight states across the country joined a community of peers as innovators and early adopters of the five standardized performance measures. School-based health center programs in Colorado, Connecticut, North Carolina, and Seattle King County have been working together as a part of a learning collaborative focused on how to adopt and report these five performance measures. And teams of SBHCs in New York, Ohio, California, and Minnesota have also been reporting the measures. We've learned so much from the experiences of these pioneers, and we're translating the lessons learned into resources that can be utilized by the field. If our participants in the collaborative were here sharing today, they would tell you that it's been challenging, but it's worth it. Teams of SBHC administrators, providers, IT support, and coordinators are getting together, examining the measures, and setting bold goals for improvement. Each month, they report data on the five performance measures. They started looking at that data, and many of them said, wait a second, I'm, I think there's something going on here. This data really doesn't seem to reflect what I'm doing in my health center. When you look at data, amazing things can start to happen. When people start to see data, they start to ask questions. They become aware of areas for improvement, and behavior starts to change. Teams are overcoming challenges that they felt were insurmountable just a few months ago. They're adapting their electronic health records and figuring out how to get data in and out. This has taken time for sites. And the challenges related to electronic health records cannot be underestimated. Many started by saying that they were unable to report the data that we were requesting, saying things like, well, we don't document this, or will we just do it a bit differently, or we've never done this before, or each provider does it a little bit differently. But now they can. The motivation to improve is awesome to observe. Working across all five measures, they're adopting strategies, which we're going to share with you today, on how to make improvements. And put simply, they're delivering better care because of this initiative. So today, we're inviting you to join us in this movement. We're calling it Quality Counts, and this is your opportunity to adopt the performance measures. We've created a strategy for the upcoming year that will help us reach toward our goal of 50% adoption. We're taking what we're calling a top-down and bottom-up approach to reach toward our goal 
and we're engaging stakeholders at every level to succeed. So let's start at the top. Over the next year, we'll work with many of the national, state, regional, and local partners to try and streamline how we collect data about school-based health centers. In states, regions, and school-based health center programs where reporting performance measurement data is a requirement of funding, if we can align our measures, we can leverage our resources toward a shared goal that will ultimately lead us to telling a stronger story about school-based health center programs. Since I saw many of you at the convention this summer, I've been on the phone for the majority of the time, um, engaging in what have been really rich discussions about how we can work together with states and some of the larger school-based health center programs to build this shared vision and get school-based health centers to document and report the same data. We've connected with our colleagues in New York, Connecticut, Arkansas, North Carolina, Maryland, California, Oregon, Colorado, Massachusetts, Delaware, Maine, um, D.C., Washington, Pennsylvania, Georgia, California, and West Virginia. And we've spent time talking about the technical supports and resources school-based health centers might need to adopt and report the performance measures knowing that they're not going to be available immediately, but working together to think about what's possible and how we can work together. We have verbal commitments from more than 300 school-based health centers that they're going to document and report the five performance measures for the 2016-17 school year. So we're also working together to create a groundswell from the bottom, of up, from the bottom up those places and school-based health center programs where there's enthusiasm and motivation to be part of this national movement. So for all of you on the call today, we are calling on you and inviting you to voluntarily adopt and report the performance measures. We know that this work can feel daunting, so we've tried to simplify it into a series of steps for the upcoming year and we'll provide you with resources to support you in the process. So this is what we're asking you to do. Right now, if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to form a team. Get all hands on deck and get all those hands to buy in. Engage your sponsoring organization and get school-based health center staff, the providers, coordinators, and support staff together and make a plan to check in regularly throughout the year about how this work is going. We also encourage you to review the measure definitions, the promising strategies, and frequently asked questions. Because as I said, we want to do everything that we can to make sure that we are capturing information from all of you that can be helpful if we disseminate it and make it available publicly. It may be um, that you're um, already required to report similar data, but your definitions may vary slightly. Oh, excuse me. Um, and so reviewing the, the definitions and the promising strategies is really important at this stage. And we can't stress enough how important it is from, from day one to identify the IT support and adapt your EHR. If you have access to IT or EHR vendor support, get them on board as early as possible and ask them to help set up your electronic health record to capture this information. This fall, right now, we are going to kick off the collection of the five performance measures. This winter, you're going to practice, practice, practice. This work takes practice. You're going to make sure that all providers are entering data the same way and practice extracting data from your electronic health record. We'll invite you to share data with the Alliance in January 2017 and populate a report that will show you how you compare to other health centers who have adopted the measures and reported. The more you can practice extracting the data and examining it, the better. Next summer or fall, 
we'll invite you to report the five performance measures at the end of the 2016-17 school year. So some of you might be asking, are they requesting personal or protected health information about My Health Center clients? The answer is no. Participants will only be asked to report aggregate, de-identified health center client data. You will not provide any protected health information about health center clients, such as an individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health condition. Others of you are probably asking, so what supports is the Alliance going to offer us? Like I mentioned, we are pulling the promising strategies from our learning collaborative participants and have translated them into resources for you. We're at the start of this, and this is going to be an ongoing process of, when, of what we are consistently receiving feedback from all of you, from our COIN participants, and trying to make it available. So the first support that we've developed is a website, um, and it provides a bunch of information about quality counts. If you go to our website, which we're going to do briefly uh, in a moment, um, you'll go to quality counts and it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And I'm going to go through the website with you very shortly uh, to show you a bit more about what's possible here. We are also having this fall webinar series a series of three webinars starting with today um, to provide you with some basic information and highlight some promising and successful strategies in order to do this work. So today we're really focusing on the basics. What are the five measures and how do you get started in adopting them? On October 11th, we'll, our second webinar in the series is called Setting You and Your EHR, EHR Up for Success in documenting and reporting the five standardized performance measures for school-based health centers. We're going um, to have our colleagues, Maureen Daly and Lynn Bakken, who are expert faculty in our learning collaborative, to share lessons learned and promising strategies for setting up your EHR. In November, and we'll be scheduling um, the date and time shortly, the webinar will be called Shine and Share, Promising Strategies for Documenting and Reporting the Five Standardized Performance Measures, where we'll have participants in our learning collaborative sharing ideas and stories about how they've done this work. We'll also have office hours this fall. The first two office hours are scheduled for Wednesday, October 19th from 1 to 2 p.m. and Wednesday, November 16th from 1 to 2 p.m. We'll include more information on our website about those office hours, but basically I'll just ask you to call me and my colleagues um, and we'll all be on the end of the line to help individuals with questions that they might have. And the more individuals who, are on, um, who join that, the better, because I bet together we can help answer one another's questions. So now we're going to move to the website, and I'm going to try and bring some of this to life. So this is the Quality Counts website that I mentioned. Over here, um, you can scroll through the different options, um, which share different types of information about the initiative, starting with some broad level information about why Quality Counts bringing some perspectives from leaders in our field about the potential and power of this initiative to describe the work that we're doing. You can read in this section a bit more about the measure selection process. Here you can read about the five performance measures. Here a bit about setting up for success. In this tab, compare your data nationally. You'll read about how we're collecting data from, from you. In the data use and privacy section, you can read about um, our pri how we are protecting the, pr the privacy and, the, and that we are not collecting any protected health information. And here in this section, you can learn about upcoming webinars, office hours, and access archived webinars. And finally, if you want to send us a technical assistance request, click here and we'll help you with your questions. 
So where I want to spend um, the next bit of time is in the five performance measures section. Here you can review um, the definitions of the five performance measures and learn about promising strategies for centers to improve the care they deliver. So I'm going to go through uh, two of the measures and show you the information that's there. And then when we open it up to Q&A, we can come back and go through more specifically. So if you click here, you'll see the definition of the well child visit that we're putting forward. You'll see the data, the specific data that we'll be asking for, the source of the information, the age range, and suggested claim or encounter codes um, that you will use to document the care delivered, and then just some notes on inclusions and exclusions. So the definition for the well child visit is the percentage of unduplicated clients who had at least one comprehensive well care visit with a primary care provider or an OBGYN practitioner during the school year, regardless of where the exam was provided, including documentation of health and developmental history and a physical exam and health education and anticipatory guidance. The two things um, that would that, that should be called to your attention are that this is a comprehensive visit and we are really interested in knowing whether a student has had a visit regardless of whether the exam was provided um, in the school-based health center or by another provider in the community. Aligning with the HEDIS measure definition and pushing the school-based health care field to do what it's capable of doing so well in, in working with community providers to make sure that these young um, people are accessing the care that they need and trying to avoid uh, duplication of services. So as you look to set up your electronic health record and work with your team about what is the specific data that they're asking for, we encourage you to look at these specific definitions. When we ask you to report the data, when we give the opportunity um, this winter to practice and then for the school year, these are the specific, this is the exact language that we'll be asking of you as you report the measures. These suggested claim and encounter codes are just suggestions. Um, you may use other ones, but these is just meant to be a helpful list for you to get started. And now I want to move down to some promising strategies. These are promising strategies that we've learned um, during the first year of our learning collaborative. And this is what they said may be helpful. They said convert acute care visits to comprehensive well child visits as time permits. Convert sports physicals into comprehensive well child visits by including age appropriate components including preventive services. Implement an electronic health record tickler system to identify students due for well child visits. Work in partnership with school staff, the school nurse or social worker and parents to identify students who need a well child visit and schedule visits at the school based health center. Document well child visits that happen outside the health center. Create a local use procedure code for providers to track clients receiving a well child visit outside of the SBHC, or use a separate Excel spreadsheet to track performance measure data components. So I think that the first frequently asked question here is the one that many of you are probably asking. So how do I document those well child visits that happen outside of the school-based health center? What we've learned in our learning collaborative is that only a handful of school-based health centers participating in the initiative were collecting and documenting information about well-child visits outside of the school-based health center when we started. And now three times as many are doing so. And they've come up with ways to do it. So the first recommendation is to check your regional or state health information exchange or, res or registry. Some regions and states have health information exchanges where information on care 
um, received is publicly av available, particularly for um, Medicaid services. We encourage you to build relationships with providers in your community. One state SBHC staff went to providers in the community and offered a box of donuts in exchange for the opportunity to tell them about their school-based health center, their interest in coordinating care with them, and the specific information that they would need about well-child visits. Just ask. Ask the client. Ask the parent of the client. Ask the primary care provider, the school nurse, or the school record system, if it exists, if an SBHC client received a well-child visit during the past 12 months. Create a process to document and extract the data. If you're entering well-child visits performed outside of the school-based health centers as a note, narrative, or comment field, convert those discrete fields or obser um, observational terms so that the data are more easily extractable. I think that's a lesson across each of these measures, that a lot of this information is, is information that may be written as notes. And as you set up your electronic health record, ensuring that there's a field in order um, and a place to enter that data and that all providers are doing it the same way is how you all are going to set yourselves up for success in this work. Or you might create your own system for documentation. While the majority of school-based health centers, our last census told us that 87% of school-based health centers have electronic health records, um, it may be that you're not operating on an electronic health record and you want to enter data into an Excel spreadsheet to track students um, who, haven't, who have had a well-child visit outside of the school-based health center. The next frequently asked question is, well, how do I know if a well-child visit completed outside of the school-based health center was comprehensive? This is a challenging question to answer. And in the, unless another provider explicitly shares that it was comprehensive, um, you might not know. So we're encouraging you to ask the school-based health center client or his or her parents specific questions, such as, did the provider ask you in detail about your health history, and it may be um, that you may have to use clinical judgment to determine whether the visit was comprehensive. We're acknowledging that this work is hard and that this is a starting point and that starting to ask these challenging questions and starting to build these relationships and exchange this information will take time, but these are some of the strategies that may be helpful to you um, as you get into this work. We're going to try to provide some other resources as well that could be useful. And we'd love it if you come across a resource or have a story to tell um, or come up with a strategy based on your work that you don't feel is reflected here in our list or you have a question and, pr and, and many of these questions repeat themselves, send it to us. Send it to us and we'll add these questions to the website. So, as you scroll through this page, there's a section just like the one that I just went through for each of the five measures. So I'm going to scroll down now and go now through the depression screening measure. This is a measure that is more adolescent focused um, and is a measure that um, some folks have found challenges with as well. And so the definition here is the percentage of unduplicated SBHC clients age 12 or greater with documentation of at least once during the school year that they were screened for clinical depression using an age-appropriate standardized tool and a follow-up plan was documented if there was a positive screen. Here you'll see those specific definitions, those the, that are the numbers that we'll be requesting in order to calculate that measure. So what's important to note um, here is that we want to know um, this second piece as well, not just that the students were screened for depression, but that there was also a follow-up plan documented if there was this positive screen. This measure aligns 
um, with the UDS, which is the data set for federally qualified health centers, and the CMS meaningful use measures. Here you'll see suggested claim and encounter codes. And I want to share a couple of promising strategies that have been used um, by participants in our COIN. They encourage you to conduct a brief depression screening during each well child visit and or new client visit. And develop shared care plans with SBHC clients receiving primary care and behavioral health to be tracked by all providers. So a frequent question that we get both for the risk assessment and for the depression screening is what screening tool should we be using? As it relates to the risk assessment, the second measure, we are not uh, endorsing or forcing anybody to use any specific tool. However, on this website you'll find recommendations of tools for both. As it relates to the risk assessment, we encourage you to look at resources from Bright Futures or consider using the RAPS assessment tool. And for the depression screening, we, you might consider using the PHQ-2 as an initial brief screen, and the PHQ-9 can be in, administered as a follow-up screen or as the initial screen if time allows, because both have been validated for use with adolescent populations. So many of you may be documenting that um, a depression screen has been completed, but it may be that there isn't a field in your electronic health record to document whether or not that, that um, screening was positive. So one of the things, as you'll see in the second question here, how do I document a positive screen and a follow-up plan if the depression screening is positive? You'll need to build a discrete field in your electronic health record to enter the screening scores and or indicate whether the screen was positive or negative. And then separately build up a discrete field that captures the follow-up plan. Another question is if a depression screen is part of a risk assessment, how can we separate it out in order to report it? So if your risk assessment includes a depression screen, count those visits towards the number of students with a depression screen. And you can also create a discrete field to track that a depression screening was completed as a separate service from the risk assessment and add another discrete field to track the screening results. So similarly, we're going to offer you some additional resources that may be useful to review and encourage you to share resources with us. So I want to encourage you all to come back to this website after the webinar and continue um, to review the information that's here. So I think this initiative is going to challenge this field to align its priorities. And the potential gains are enormous. It's really an unprecedented opportunity to tell our story in a more uniform way. It will allow us to learn from school-based health centers what they're doing particularly well, and it will help us find ways that we can improve. We'll be able to show everybody that school-based health centers are vital to the healthcare system and vital to the communities that we serve. These data will, be, will allow us to show what we, are, we already know. We'll be able to prove to others that care is top notch. These data will resonate with our national partners and you'll be recognized for all the hard work that you're doing because a positive light will be shined on school-based health centers. Let's do this together. Let's continue to build momentum around this national initiative um, and show the value of the school-based health center model. So that by 2018, our map of school-based health centers voluntarily adopting and reporting the measures looks a bit more like this. 
The payoff will be worth it. We'll be providing better care and helping the model to grow. So we want to take a moment for about the next five minutes or so before we get into questions to ask this question, will you join us? If you see on your screen, there's a link. And if you go into the chat box um, here, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to click on that link um, in order to connect to a really brief survey that asks you, are you ready to join this initiative? Um, and if not, perhaps very quickly provide us some information um, on what information you might need or what supports you feel you might need in order to do this um, and be a part of this national initiative. So I'm just going to pause for two or three minutes and allow you to complete that survey. I'm going to give everyone another 15 to 30 seconds uh, to complete that brief survey um, or ask that um, you complete it after the webinar if possible. This information is so helpful to us as um, we start to be able to show to our funder the motivation and initiative and excitement around this initiative in the field and how we're moving towards our goals. So I want to open it up to questions now. Several of you have um, written questions already, uh, and we're going to start with those. And we encourage you to write your questions into the question box um, or into the chat box in order uh, to, uh, and, and we'll address each one of them. I see um, it, it says for denominators, does it require a provider visit or any visit with staff um, for medical administration? Okay, so I'm imagining, um, and we may need to follow up with the specifics of this offline or perhaps you can provide some, some detail, but we have definitions on our website of, um, of each of these elements and what, what counts as a visit. And that's a, a, a visit with any provider in the, um, in the school-based health center, so with a primary care provider or a, a behavioral health provider. The second question is, are these measures comparable 
to CMS children's core set of quality measures that are reported to the state level by Medicaid and CHIP agencies? And the answer is yes. As we um, launched into the process of selecting a set of standardized performance measures for school-based health centers, we did not want to reinvent the wheel across the board for how um, we define our measures. So we pulled from national child quality measurement framework definitions to use as our definition. The next question is, are you capturing data from SBHCs that are using trauma-informed care? Are you able to evaluate the results and re uh, report the impact of trauma-informed care? And does trauma-informed care reduce the overall utilization of emergency departments? So these are great questions. Um, thank you for posing them. But that really um, is not the focus of these five measures. Um, we encourage you to capture that information. Uh, and some excellent work across the field is going on related to trauma-informed care. But no, we will not be capturing data from school-based health centers that are using trauma-informed care for this initiative. So the next comment is that Louisiana will support this initiative, um, and we're thrilled. We're thrilled for that. Louisiana is a state uh, that is going to include the performance measures through the requirements that school-based health centers are through the measures that school-based health centers are required to report to the state. So we're thrilled to have built this relationship in, in aligning the measures. So the next question is, what is the anticipated percentage of students who meet all? Some patients come in that are very acute, and screening, not appropriate, may not return for the remainder of the year. That's a great question. By completing a comprehensive well-child visit, it should include a risk assessment, a BMI screening, and for an adolescent, that risk assessment is very likely to include a depression screening. So by completing that well-child visit, it's possible that you will meet several of these measures in one in a one-stop type of opportunity. However, we know that not all young people access uh, or go to the school-based health centers for their well-child visit. So we're encouraging um, the field and providers to provide a risk assessment or a depression screen regardless of whether or not the student, uh, sorry, if the child has had a well-child visit outside of the school-based health center. And this is a, um, a separate question but sort of connected and many people have asked um, in these calls that I've been on in the past month, what if we're not ready to report all of the five measures? Do I have to report all five uh, for my program? And the answer is no. The answer is really, like I said earlier, is that we're trying to move the field forward but meet the field where it is, understanding that in some settings, a health center, a school-based health center may be accustomed to reporting this data. And in other settings, this might be the first time that a school-based health center is reporting these performance measures. This is our first year of pushing the field to do this, so we want you to take on what's reasonable and feasible for your school-based health center with a vision of adopting the five measures over time, but not necessarily fighting off everything from day one. The next question is, how do I put in the discrete fields? My clinic uses a free web-based EMR, and they do not make changes based on a small group. So 
I'm going to encourage you to join our next webinar um, next um, month that's really going to be focused on adapting EHRs and encourage you um, to bring that question up then with uh, brought with with our presenters who may be able to give you some specific information, but um, in the meantime, it may be possible um, to document some of this information perhaps in a separate place, like an Excel spreadsheet, if you're not actually documenting the measures. And I encourage you to follow up um, with me, um, and I'll connect with my colleagues, and we may be able to connect you with someone who's using a, 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 the same EHR and may or may not have had successes um, with, with a similar question. So the next question is, it looks like several of the measures will require sites to create additional fields on the depression screens and well child visits. What if there's a willingness to capture this information, but a reluctance from the contractor who manages our database to create these additional fields? So this is an excellent question and one that our participants in our learning collaborative have had to um, struggle with. We encourage you to um, start by engaging people um, at multiple levels. So engage higher level administrators in your sponsoring organization to talk about this initiative, why it's important, to get their buy-in because it may be um, that if, if multiple members of, you know, of the team come in uh, asking for something similar or someone at a slightly higher level within the organization is making the ask, that might be a helpful way um, to tackle this challenge. Um, and again, I would encourage you to join the webinar next month where there will be um, individuals with expertise in this topic who, who can help. So the next question is, what are you looking to capture with tracking well child visits outside of the school-based health center? Is this measurement separate than the number of well child visits in the school-based health center, therefore reporting two measurements? So great question. Yes, this is two measurements. We'll be asking you to report the number of unduplicated clients who have had a well child visit in the school-based health center, and separately, the number of well child visits, number of students who have had a well child visit outside of the school based health center, those numbers will be added together to divide to determine the percentage of students who have had a well child visit regardless of where it happened. So why are we pushing the school based health care field to think about school based health center, uh, to think about visits that have happened outside of the school based health center? This is the HEDIS measure, and we've decided to adopt the HEDIS measure as our measure definition to see if we can push the school-based healthcare field to think beyond um, the, the, the clinic walls and build relationships with the community, um, taking responsibility and accountability for the young people who live there in order to reduce the duplication of services and be accountable that the preventive services um, that are recommended have been received by the um, child. So someone has said that they would like to follow up um, directly. Um, my name is Haley Love, and my, uh, I will be sharing my email address very shortly at the end of the webinar. So the next question says, um, it's been noted that some children are over 21 years old. They're up to 23. Are we capturing these children in the data? They are being seen in the school-based health center. Okay, I think some context for this might be helpful um, for me to understand so I can follow up after um, the um, after the call because I um, 
need to better understand before, before I'm able to answer that question. So the next question is in Delaware for enrollees to be provided a chlamydia screen, the school board at the sites would have to approve such services. In addition, the parent has to consent to the service. So would the data be reliable if you only documented those enrollees who can and did receive the screen? I think that the answer um, is yes. That we understand with that that this measure um, that in some that there are various reasons why this measure is challenging across the board, um, and that any data related to sexual and reproductive health um, can be politically um, complicated in terms of its reporting. So. Um, we appreciate you providing that context for, for the challenge as it relates to this measure in Delaware because I'm sure that it's echoed across um, the country. Um, and so it's helpful to understand that as we look at this data that it would be reflective um, of these potential caveats or, or, or potential limitations. But yes. So, the last question we have so far, unless anybody wants to type one is, is that some of our patients are seen at the SVHC for confidential visits only. They have PCPs outside of our clinic. It would be hard to access their last well child check without breaching confidentiality. So I guess um, Lisa, uh, I would like to follow up with this person as well about um, this specific context and better understand here. Um, perhaps you might be able um, just to ask the student whether they have had a, a well child visit. Um, but perhaps if I can follow up with you afterwards and better understand the limitations here and the challenges, then we can address your question. Um, and if, if the finding there is, is applicable to other school-based health centers, we'll add it to our website. All right, so thank you for those excellent questions. Um, and we hope that you'll keep them coming. So I want to point you to our next webinar, um, which is scheduled for Tuesday, October 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can, uh, if you go to our website, you can register for the webinar. We hope to see many of you there. And if you have questions or want to follow up about anything related to this webinar, this is my email address. Please contact me. Um, and we'll address your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Selena, who is now going to finish up very quickly with a few final messages. The School Based Health Alliance works to improve the health status of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school based health care. And our members extend and support our work. Trainings like this webinar would not be possible without them. So in addition, our members receive exclusive access to valuable programs, tools, timely publications, and networking opportunities. So please take a moment after the presentation to visit www.sbhforall.org slash membership for more information and to join. At this time, we have a few poll questions to gauge how um, we can help you in the future and how this training was successful. The first question is, did this presentation meet your needs? Yes or no? We'll take a couple of seconds to answer that.
Our next question is, how well did the presentation meet the state objectives? Our next question is, how likely are you to apply the information from the presentation in your organization? And our final question is, would you recommend this webinar to others? Thank you all for your feedback. Lastly, we welcome you to submit for our call for abstracts, which will open September 19th through November 6th for the 2017 National School-Based Healthcare Convention, which will take place June 18th through the 21st in Long Beach, California. So please look for that information via our digest and on our website. So we just want to conclude by saying thank you so much for joining uh, the webinar this afternoon. Thank you for all the rich and great questions. Please continue to send them our way. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar and or in our office hours this fall. Thank you, everyone. Bye.